Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio, with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Anfield Index Pro Plus. I'm Dave Hendrick, and today's podcast is a little bit different. Now, before I introduce my co-host for this pod, I want to give you a little bit of explanation on why we're doing this podcast. So the topic of today is anti-Semitism, and particularly with a view to it in the game that we all love and the app that we spend far too much of our daily lives perusing. So as some of you will be aware, about a week and a half ago, there was the release of Jordan Henderson's autobiography. And there was a quote tweet done on Henderson's tweet announcing his autobiography. And what it said was, I'd rather read Mein Kampf. Now, I retweeted it and I replied to it laughing that it had more likes and retweets than Henderson's original tweet. And I did that without actually taking the time to look at what I was retweeting to consider what it was I was retweeting and replying to. Now, that upset a number of people. And my initial reaction was one that I'm not proud of in any way. I'm quite ashamed of how I reacted to it. People weren't, I don't believe, accusing me of being anti-Semitic, but they were telling me to be a lot more careful and more for my own good than anything else. And I took it as an affront and got quite obnoxious as I am, you know, prone to doing as anyone that's listened to me or followed me for years will be aware. Uh, This caused a couple of bus stops that really should not have happened and were entirely my fault. And thankfully we have been able to work through those. I have said my apologies and I apologize to anyone that I haven't apologized to who was offended by what I did. The person I wanted to apologize to the most is the man who's going to join me now on this podcast, and that is the chairman of New York LFC, or LFC New York as it is, Justin Wells. How are you, Justin? I'm doing well, and I want to reiterate one thing, which is Dave's apology is extremely sincere, and it's important to note that at no point during this point in time did I think that Dave was an anti Semite. The point that was made and explained to, you know, explained was the, the thing that can be construed as offensive by, by, you know, by me, a Jewish person, and other Jews is the benign autobiography of a footballer that you might not rate is not on a similar par with the manuscript for a genocide right we and we and we know this right so the whole point of this podcast also is not to um belabor or you know belabor that particular point or make uh dave apologize more than he needs to because he has and his apology is sincere he knows why it was wrong i you know it was you know he and i explained this in private and uh we'd like to try to move on to use the opportunity to talk about um you know anti-semitism and football and you know in some other sports because it's uh it's having a moment, and uh, mm. you know, as a Jewish person, when you hear that anti-Semitism is having a moment, you are not a particularly comfortable human being at that point. Yeah, I think that's very fair. And the thing for me as well, and when I when I really kind of stepped back and looked at the situation, was like I I saw the tweet and saw a joke, but I saw it through the eyes of somebody that doesn't have such a horrendous moment linked to that person that has shaped their culture, their way of life, their family. 
And when I sat back and thought about it from your point of view in particular, I realized that how am I going to tell you what you should and shouldn't be offended by? You are the one that should guide me on this. In the same way that in recent times we've seen the Irish women's team being told by English people that they need some education on the history of Ireland and the horrendous things that took place in this country at the hands of the English. So me telling you, well, you can't be offended by this, is just completely out of line because this is something that you are far more aware of, far more educated on, and is far more prevalent in your day-to-day -day life than it would be in mine in a country that has a small Jewish population where I, I genuinely don't know a Jewish person in Ireland. So I, when I see things, I don't, I don't see them the same way you do because I'm not educated on the topic. And that's part of why I wanted to do this with you to discuss what anti-Semitism is, how we're seeing it in society, how we're seeing it in football, what we can do to combat it. And, you know, when we talk about different types of bigotry, some are a lot more obvious. Like homophobia is a lot more obvious. Um, racism is a lot more obvious. Anti-Semitism isn't always as obvious and we need to be far more vigilant about spotting it and stamping it out rather than what I did, which was to give it the air of publicity. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with that because, it, you know, as far as anti-Semitism being a lot less obvious, a lot of it's based upon older tropes and a lot of it's based upon the fact that, you know, if you look at large portions of the Jewish population of the world, um, many of us are just, you know, we're, we're white. Um, so the first thing you see, you know, with racism, it's a lot more obvious because as much as people don't want to say this, the, one of the first things you'll see is the color of someone's skin and many, you know, judging people based on that. That's racism, right? On the other hand, anti-Semitism is basing it, it is a it's a hatred that's quasi-religious, quasi-cultural. It's existed in Western culture for you know two thousand plus years, um, probably longer. It's probably you know anti-Semitism in Western culture is as old as you know Jews living in Western culture. Uh, you know the Jewish diaspora happened in seventy A.D. and anti-Semitism in Western, cult Western culture, uh, you know, even predates that. But it's, uh, it, there, you know, to break down kind of what it is, besides just the hatred of a culture and a religion, there are certain tropes that you'll see that are widely put out there. That, so, um, you know, if, if you followed the NBA or you just follow American culture, you'll know about the obvious uh, anti-Semitism of Kyrie Irving and Kanye Wesley. And what they've been putting out is, um, you know, the, the first trope and the one that's most harmful harmful at the moment is uh, that Jews run the world and that we control the world's finances, um, mm. which, you know, it, ha it, it where it comes from, it comes from in Middle Ages Europe. Um, many Christians were forbidden from using things like banking services. So money lending was, you know, a Jewish activity. And the history of how that evolved turned into the stereotype of Jews being stingy, Jews being cheap, and Jews being, um, you know, in control of the banking system. And that evolved into a lot of other tropes, like uh, if you've ever heard of the Dreyfus Affair or the Rothschilds in France, you know, ultimately that, you know, there's a Jewish conspiracy to control uh, our country, you know, our countries and the world. And that's being, at the moment, amplified by people like Kyrie Irving and Kanye West. It was amplified, it's been amplified for, you know, as long as there's been right-wing fascist movements um, throughout, you know, throughout Western Europe. Like, that's one of the central themes as to why a lot of nationalist movements and far, far right-wing movements, you know, target Jews is the belief that they are trying to take over our society and erode our values and, uh, you know, implement a world that they like that runs counter to our national. 
So anti-Semitism very much takes this particular form. And this has been the blueprint that's allowed for it to spread like wildfire because it's based on misinformation and it's based upon historical prejudices that haven't been resolved by education. Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. So right now I'm, I'm looking at the AJC.org website, the American Jewish Committee, and they have multiple articles up there. And along the left-hand side of the screen is a, a hate glossary of different words that are used to describe Jewish people and this belief that Jewish people are the new world order, or as which is an even more disgusting phrase, the Jew world order, trying to take over the world by controlling the world's finances. Talk of the deep state. Uh, and, and it's media too, right? Yes. That's also a big portion of the conspiracy. Of course, and things like the CIA being controlled by this new world order and you know, the assassination of certain people by this new world order, people who threatened to take it over. And, and there's a bunch of phrases here that are, are just, they're not things that I, I ever would have put two and two together with. The phrase deadly exchange, the phrase great replacement. Uh, there's other disgusting ones like holoca uh, Holocaust, which is obviously to do with Holocaust denial. Uh, the Illuminati is another one that's constantly linked to Jewish people and Jewish culture. And as you mentioned, we we have seen in the last couple of weeks uh, two very, very prominent people in American culture. One, one of the most recognizable athletes in American sport being Kyrie Irving, who promoted a documentary that denies the Holocaust. He then followed that up by refusing to condemn the documentary, by refusing to say that he did not believe what it was said. There's been a week and a half of back and forth with him, him making accusations that media members who questioned him on this, including Nick Friedell of ESPN, were trying to get famous, trying to get clips for their Instagram off of him because Nick Friedell challenged him on the topic. And it took the Nets suspending him yesterday after the NBA failed to act to for him to actually come out and issue an apology. And even in that apology, to me, and I don't know about you, it didn't seem sincere, Justin, because if it was a sincere apology, surely it would have come before he was suspended, when he sat at a podium in front of people and was asked questions, when he was in press gaggles, Surely then was the time to apologize, not in a statement on Instagram. And the thing is with this is that Kyrie is now, before this, he is, I don't believe Kyrie Irving is of sane mind. He is a flat earther. He is a, an anti-vaxxer. He has, at different, states, at different stages in the last few years, um, move towards becoming a Muslim, then become a devout Christian. We have seen him constantly set fire to good situations that he's been in in his own career. And now that it's going to cost him a lot of money, because his NBA career could potentially be over. Now, I, I think 
the NBA, a lot of the teams will lack the morals to say we're not having him around and that his talent will override that. But we've seen Nike suspend their agreement with him. When this started to hurt him financially, that's when he came out and apologised. Before that, he was quite indignant about it. And, And look, having been a little bit indignant myself, I can get that mindset, but his 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 apology to me did not seem sincere. I, I don't really think it was an apology because I don't think that the words I apologize or I'm sorry appear, which, you know, those are necessary components of an apology, right? What are you, what are you doing? You're telling someone I, you know, I'm showing remorse for this particular action. There's no remorse in it, right? He's using whatever platform he has to uh, give attention to a three and a half hour long movie about how, you know, the, the you know, but, but I'm not going to watch the movie, right? Because no. I, I don't, I, I have no, I, I don't, you know, this is going to sound weird coming into this particular podcast. I don't hate myself enough to do that. Yeah. Um, but, it, it, you know, one of the central tenets of the like you know the screenshot we've seen is that the Holocaust didn't happen. I can tell you for certainty the Holocaust happened. I have people in my family who I've known my entire life who were in Germany in the 30s because that's where they lived and that's what they that's the situation they had to escape. So it very much happened. The insult of uh, saying that it didn't is uh, really frustrating for two reasons. One, the simple denial the simple denial of it, and two. And, you know, as Liverpool supporters, we know this because of why we continue to talk about Hillsborough. It's for the same reason. Yes. The reason the Holocaust is important is because of the fact that, you know, it's already happened to us as Jews, right? Nothing to say that anti-Semitism is, you know, long gone, because obviously we know it's not. But the reason it's important to educate it is so that it doesn't happen again to someone else. Same thing with the same reason that Hillsborough is important. You educate people so that it doesn't happen to someone else. These aren't sectarian and tribal interests these are interests in just shared humanity and having empathy for others and the fact that Kyrie Irving is is going to do this and basically point out that you know Jews are the reason for the plight of black people in America is part of the thesis there it's offensive Mm. there's a lot of you know I'm not saying that Jewish hands are clean in the racism that's existed in America, because they are very much not. But at the same token, that doesn't mean that the answer to that needs to be to, you know, more hatred. That, that, that you, you know what I'm talking about. Of course. I mean, the thing, the thing that's always got me with the the idea that people would deny the Holocaust, it like it's it's like denying that slavery took place or that the famine took place in Ireland. It's it it's you're denying reality. You're denying factual things that are well documented. The the documentation of the Holocaust isn't something that was done in the seventies. It was done at the time. It's it's such a bizarre thing. By the people thing. doing it. By the people doing it. Yes, exactly. The people who committed the heinous crimes in the 30s and 40s, they documented it themselves. Yeah. And people want to to deny this. I don't know if anyone has seen the film Denial. Um, it's about when um, a journalist sued a a, a holocaust scholar sued a holocaust denier by the name of david irving for libel and it's it's a brilliant film it's a bit of a tough watch but it is genuinely a brilliant film and to see his arguments getting completely and utterly torn apart were is, is is good to see and obviously is factual based on what we know happened and look, I, I, when it, when the, the problem I see with with someone like Kyrie and Kanye West coming out with their anti-Semitic 
tropes, anti-Semitic support, whatever the case may be, is that these are really influential individuals, like really influential individuals with massive groups of what I would class as fanboys. Some people call them stands. People who will go to bat for these heroes, regardless of what they say. And they will push the narrative that, well, Kyrie is right or Kanye is right. And why are you doing this to him? All he's doing is speaking a different truth to yours and all this type of stuff. This is where the real damage, like if Kyrie Irving was a nobody and came out and said, oh, you know, I, I watched this documentary. It denies the Holocaust and I thought it was really good or really interesting. You'd just be like, well, you're clearly an idiot, but you'd move on. But the fact of the matter is that Kyrie Irving is massively supported. He has nearly 18 million uh, followers on Instagram alone. He has a large following on Twitter. Um, on Twitter, he has, where are we? Nearly 5 million followers. So he is pushing this hate-filled agenda that he is associating himself with to massive numbers of people, including a lot of people who will be too naive or gullible or impressionable to dismiss it as what it is and call it out for what it is. What he will do is he will push that garbage onto the minds of impressionable young people who look up to him as an idol, as a role model, and he will poison their minds. And for me, that's the biggest issue. The same thing goes for Kanye, who is ridiculously popular and famous. And another who clearly, and I think Kanye has actually been diagnosed, I think Kim Kardashian has said he has been diagnosed with um, mental health problems. But people hear him say stuff and adopt that as their own view on the world because they're young and impressionable or they're just a little bit simple. Yeah, and, and it, you know, it's it's down to also the fact that, and, and this is, you know, me speaking about what I you know firmly believe, which is mental health issues are a thing that our societies need to take very seriously. They also don't form a shell for criticism when you do something that is this hates right kanye west is putting out anti-semitic tribe to 31 million followers on twitter you know mental health issues you know i'm sympathetic to them but i'm not sympathetic to them when they manifest themselves in that kind of way and there's another thing that that, that i that i believe in I, and i think we should probably shift to talking about how this uh, influences football soon but um we are all stronger as people when we actually sit there and try to find the things that unite us rather than trying to allow for these, you know, very manufactured hatreds to divide us, right? Um, mm. This this is, you know, it's, it's a basic point against bigotry, about bigotry. I don't really believe that you can stand against one form of bigotry without standing against them all. And, you know, that's, there, there's nothing more you can say. That's basically what I feel. No, I, I think that's exactly right. You you can't, on one hand, turn around and criticize people, white people, for using the N-word, while at the same time agreeing with someone who thinks that all gay people should be executed. Like, you're right. You can't be one without being the other. If you are in any way bigoted, that is going to spread across the board. I, I agree with you. I don't think mental health is a real excuse for any of this. If a white person was to come out and like a famous white person came out and used racist language against a Kyrie Irving or a Kanye West and then turned around and said, oh, well, I have mental health issues, it, it wouldn't matter. That would just be the end of their career. They would be finished. So I I, I think this needs to be the end of, of both of these. And, and like you say, we should shift to to the footballing uh, link to this. And and the thing that, that gets me here and, and how I think it's so related is 
the the stands who follow these people and the, they're fans of these people. They live their life by these people, and much of it is is a tribalistic, you know, gravitation towards a leader, you know, a figurehead. And tribalism is is everywhere. Everybody has someone or something that they have a little bit of a prejudice against, be it a major thing, a small thing, be it a real life thing or a sports thing. Like, for example, I know a lot of New Yorkers where you live, live by the mantra of when it comes to sports, fuck Boston, right? Where I live, yeah. where, me and, where me and Trev live, we, we don't like the county of Loud. Now, the people of Loud are fine, but if we're playing Loud, that's like, that's a little bit different. It becomes a real thing where we, we want to beat Loud every time and they want to beat us. But that doesn't hurt anybody in the same way that, you know, the a, a random New Yorker saying, you know, fuck the Celtics or whatever, doesn't hurt anybody. It's just, it's a sports thing. But when when it comes to football and it comes to the tribalistic nature of football, and you referenced Hillsborough earlier on, it's a perfect way to move into this. We see fans of other clubs in recent weeks, recent months, recent years, the last the last 33 years, if we're all being honest, singing songs about Hillsborough, chanting about Hillsborough, going further, chanting about Heisel, thinking that they're honouring the memory of the people who died at Heisel by calling Liverpool fans murderers, when in truth, none of those people can name a single person who died in the Heisel disaster. And what they're actually doing is they're hurting the memory of those people and they're dragging up things that are going to stir up upset and anger in the family and friends of the people that passed away at Heysel. And at Manchester with Manchester United, it's chants about Munich or, you know, people doing aeroplane impressions. With two particular clubs that are one in the Premier League, one who's a regular in Europe that we see and know a lot of, Tottenham Hotspur and Ajax, the main way this tribalism manifests against those clubs is references to Jewish culture. And this is where I want you to to really dig into this because this is something that you've spoken about a few times. And when we started talking about doing this podcast, this was something you really wanted to to delve into. So what is it about those two clubs that people try to pick at? So both of those clubs in particular, I'll start with Spurs, right? Spurs, as we know, North London, are in North London. North London in particular, the borough of Tottenham, has been historically a very Jewish place. There are a lot of Jewish Tottenham supporters. One of the aspects of Tottenham support has become, uh, you know, they're uh, the referring to their supporters, and some of it is some of it is self identification as you know the the Yids or the Yid army, and they've adopted a lot of Jewish symbols, including the Star of David and the Israeli flag. And I'm going to make one point about the Israeli flag, which we're going to get this. This is going to come up again later. The Star of David is a symbol that lo- long predates the founding of the state of Israel, right? And the conflation of Israel and Jews is a thing that occurs because, you know, it's a state that's nominally the Jewish state. Now, the the important thing that people need to realize is that you need to separate Jews and the state of Israel because not every single Jew is a Zionist and not every Zionist is a Jew. So these things are important to note because of the way in which they manifest how people respond to Tottenham, Ajax, some of the Israeli clubs and just, you know, jewelry in general. But when you watched, and this has been less of a thing lately because of the fact that it has been at least policed in some way. If you watch old games between Spurs and Chelsea or Spurs and West Ham, London derbies, where those two, those two fan bases I'm calling out because historically they have had a significantly larger right wing infiltration than some of the other ones. The way the thing that they would do to 
get under the skin of Spurs supporters and put some venom into the game would be emulate the hissing sound. Now, what's the hissing sound? The hissing sound is a reference to the gas chambers at the at concentration camps in World War II, which basically that's telling me your way of getting underneath our skin as a supporter group, if I was a Spurs supporter, is to effectively make fun of you know people being massacred. And this still happens to date, to date in Europe as well. And Dave mentioned this because he's heard this, you know, when we were speaking before the pod, and I've definitely heard this. When you listen, when you watch Israeli teams, they will also receive some of the sounds from the hissing like when they play in certain spots in Europe. Ajax, similarly, Amsterdam is a city that has a deep and long-standing um, Jewish culture and Jewish heritage. I mean, one of the most prominent, uh, you know, pieces of Holocaust uh, documentary was done there, which is the Diary of Anne Frank. And you can mm. still go see the attic in which Anne Frank hid for years in Amsterdam. I asked, as you know, it, it, because Amsterdam is a very Jewish city, there are some deep lying roots between Ajax and the Jewish community there. And both and, and as well, they have taken up deep Jewish identity now. The repercussion of this through football, as I mentioned, they go through a lot of the same type of tears and jeers that Spurs do. And I don't want to call it tears. I want to call these basically, this is this is racist and anti-Semitic chanting. Ajax goes through that as well. Mm. And there's actually a fantastic chapter in Frederick Ford's book, How Football Explains the World, that ex- you know that goes very deeply into how anti-Semitism can be very easily explained by just looking at these particular kinds of clubs. This is a 25 year old book and somehow still to date is seemingly, you know, accurate verbatim. Like it doesn't feel as if things have changed enough and people still bait against that particular identity, just as within tribal bands or within football. Now, one of the things that I'm glad about with Liverpool support is we don't typically go there. We haven't gone there. I've never heard of it gone there, going there. And my and my only comment here is, let's keep that going. I'll never go there. Yeah, I mean, there there are just so many different lines that are crossed when you are watching a Spurs game or an Ajax game, or indeed whether it's you know Maccabee Tel Aviv, Maccabee Haifa, whoever, whichever Israeli team playing in Europe and you hear the hissing sound and I I don't think people always connect with the idea of what it is that they're hearing I remember uh, Jacob Steinberg who's a, a journalist for the Guardian a very good journalist for the Guardian and who I believe is a West Ham fan this is about maybe six or seven years ago West Ham were playing Tottenham at Tottenham, and he was there in the press box, and he tweeted during the game about how upset he was to hear hissing sounds coming from the West Ham end. This led to him getting absolute torrents of abuse from West Ham fans. Um, Now, Jacob Steinberg, as you might guess by the name Steinberg, is Jewish himself. And He had to, this is a like a national journalist reporting as fact something that took place from the fan base that he is technically part of and his own co fans or or fellow fans were calling him all manner of things. He had to lock his account on Twitter, I think he kept it locked for about a year after that. And when you see people like Jacob Steinberg calling that out, you know it's not just a one-off incident. You know it's something that's been prevalent for a while. And the Ajax thing, it's its always been like that as well. And uh, I remember being at the Amsterdam Arena or the Johan Cruyff Arena as it is now and watching Ajax play and they're playing Feyenoord. And I remember hearing a hissing sound and I was quite confused at first as to what was going on because 
for whatever reason, I'd never fully connected the the Ajax Jewish thing, my own ignorance more than anything. And it was afterwards when I went home and, and looked it up that I realized what, what it actually, what I had witnessed. And I remember just being really kind of disgusted that I hadn't been part of it, but I was in the arena, in the stadium as it took place. And I remember feeling quite disgusted at having been in any way associated with that type of act that I was there and didn't do anything to try and stop it. Now, what was I to do against hundreds of people? But at the same time, just having been there and, and it makes your skin crawl, that type of flagrant lack of compassion for one of the greatest tragedies in the history of our world all for the sake of point scoring at a football match. Well, yeah, it's point scoring also. Like, it's not going to make your team play any better. It, right? Like, I, I can't picture where any single football... I mean, may, maybe this is where I'm naive. Because maybe there are some footballers who are genuinely hateful people. I'm sure that there are. But I can't see how that's going to inspire anybody to play any better, right? All that's going to do is just make the atmosphere between supporter groups significantly more fraught and full of unneeded tension in particular, in this case, some, you know, some deeply anti-Semitic venom. On the points of Spurs and Ajax, both of them have asked their supporters to, to not take up this identity because they recognize as clubs that it can do damage. And, you know, the credit to Spurs supporters is they have really just kind of stopped showing, you know, Stop using the term yid because it's actually a fairly derogatory term unless we use it ourselves. Um, and it has had some positive effect. Now, has it eradicated the problem? No, because you're still going to have idiots who are still going to you know, do this because they've been you know, doing the hissing sound for years and generations. But the, at least the clubs are taking some sort of proactive steps to try to stop these things. Now, granted, it's taken a long time because Spurs and Ajax originally stopped people asking people to do this around 2002, and they had to reiterate these appeals in 2022. So even then, it takes time to get people to try not to take on an identity that isn't theirs, but hopefully this will, at the very least, reduce the reaction of the hissing sounds because that, to me, is one of the more appalling things that can occur mm. in football. <laughs> but there yeah. are other there are other instances of this occurring too. Because if I, I don't know if you've uh, and I and I don't really recommend doing this because uh, don't read the comments whenever Liverpool Football Club um, put up a post on Twitter or on Facebook wishing Jewish people a happy holiday of any sort. I, I would. Um, I could get into I could get into why. Effectively, what will happen is you will get a lot of people um, who will respond by posting the uh, you know Palestinian flag, or which to me is actually relatively benign. And then you will actually have people who say far, far, far worse. Now, I do want to make one point that goes back to something I said earlier, which is not every single Jew is a Zionist. I myself am a non-Zionist Jew. Right. Um, I, I believe that the state of Israel, um, actually, from a political standpoint, per, you know, perpetrates crimes against the Palestinian people that actually deprive them of their humanity. And it's important to note that there are people, in particular, some Jews who think this way, because the response to wishing a Jew a happy holiday should not be, um, fuck Israel. <laughs> yes. And I do want to I do want to get into this, but just one last point on on the hissing and not making your players play better. You mentioned earlier that you, like the vast majority of Jews, are white. Many Jewish families, when they escaped Nazi occupied Germany or Poland, changed their surnames to become more westernized. So you might have Jewish people in your life and not know that they're Jewish. You might have Jewish players in your football team and not know that they're Jewish. So 
the idea that hissing at the opposition is achieving something, what you may actually be doing is you may be massively insulting one of your own players who may well be Jewish and you just don't know because he might not make it a public thing because he might be private about his religion. His family may have changed their name in the 40s, like so many did. Like mine did? <laughs> exactly. Like That's the thing. Justin Wells does not sound like a Jewish name. If your no, name was Ari totally Goldberg... Is. Yeah, it's a very yeah. English. It's a very English. It's a very English last name. It was changed. It, it was it was Velasky. Why did it change? Because my grandfather couldn't find a job during the depression, and felt, and you know, depression era in New York. Even though it had a really large Jewish population, it still had a ton of anti-Semitism. And, mm. You know, that's why he changed it because he, in particular, is a reaction to anti-Semitism and the ability to try to find work. Exactly. So that's where the whole. The, the, the whole tribalism thing, to me, it, it is the worst part of football. And it's it's this mindless need to fit in that people seem to have of, oh, well, I see others who I associate myself with say this, so therefore I believe this, in the same way that these idiots who will, you know, parrot whatever... Kanye West, who, you know, it really should just be ignored, and Kyrie Irving have to say, because somebody they associate with themselves believe this, and now they believe this. And it's the same thing when you go on social media and you see the anti-Hillsborough slurs, you see anti-Munich slurs, you see people saying things to, like, you know, Bradford fans about the fire um, that took place at their stadium. You see people saying things... Like, I have a lot of things that I can say to Rangers fans that are not in any way insulting, but they are the the differences between us. But one thing I would never dare to say is anything to do with either the high, high, the Ibrox tragedies that took place. I would never try and point score off something like that because you're feeding into this overall hatred and kind of a regression of humanity by doing these things. Now, you, you mentioned the not every Jew is a Zionist and not every Zionist is a Jew. There is... There are many things w which we can criticise Israel about, but it is the need to, I think on both sides, recognise the separation between the state of Israel and the Jewish people, the Jewish culture, the Jewish religion. Very much so. I mean, so like like you said, when when you see people replying to a post wishing Jews whatever happy Rosh Hashanah, exactly what whatever the day is. Like, there's obviously there's many important days in in the Jewish faith, and when any of them are being celebrated, replying with a Palestinian flag is not only a little bit redundant; it's also diminishing the cause of the Palestinians because Jewish people and the Jewish religion is not what is oppressing Palestinian people. It is the state of Israel that are doing that. And what is your view on people who use the idea and the, you know, the evidence that they have that what Israel, the state of Israel, is doing to the Palestinians is a form of our par apartheid, and they use that as an excuse to be anti-Semitic or to do things like deny the Holocaust or whatever it's going to be. So my, my views on this are actually pretty straightforward. A, I think what Israel is doing to the Palestinians is a form of apartheid. Um, it's, uh, you know, in, in the end, people have a right to live on the land that they, uh, to, live, to live on their land and to, to live on their land uh, freely and, to, you know, in a manner that doesn't involve constant military occupation and blockade. And, uh, you know, 
worse because worse things do happen. There are obviously large flare ups of disproportionate violence within which Israel holds the power. So they end up exerting said power. Um, I, I tend to think that people need to um, occasionally separate the political from the personal when it comes to the Israeli Palestinian conflict because there is a deep um, connection between American Jews and the state of Israel and Jews and the state of Israel because of the way in which it was founded after the Holocaust. I don't particularly share that connection because I've only spent 10 days in my entire life in Israel. I don't really plan on going back anytime soon um, for you know the reasons that I stated, which is I, I think that Israel is a is an apartheid state. I don't want to go spend money there and, and help their economy, which comes at the expense of the Palestinian people. Now, on the other hand, if you look at some of Israel's most fervent supporters, they actually are right-wing governments in the West, right? And it's because of the fact that they see Israel as the example of an ethno state that has, um, you know, managed to create its makeup of being, you know, predominantly so heavily Jewish that it's, uh, you know, it, it's an example of a, of, a, of a state that's basically built around a singular national identity, which is what a lot of right-wing governments are aiming to do in the West. You see it in you know, with the UKIP party in England, you see it with the far right wing in the Republican Party in the United States, you see it in Holland, you see it in, you know, in, in Germany, you see it in France. This is a tendency that's rippling through our societies. Um, and at the same time, it's okay to recognize that individual Jews and even individual Israeli Jews do have basic core humanity and that you shouldn't hate them just because they're Jewish. You can hate the actions of the Israeli government. You can even call them out as complicit in supporting the actions of the Israeli government, but just don't hate them because they're Jewish. That's that, that's the line I would say. I think that's very fair. I You mentioned the, the far right and their rush to support Israel. And obviously under the presidency of, of Donald Trump, um, he was very, very vocal in his support of Israel. He was, I think, a bit of an agitator in terms of, you know, moving the U.S. embassy and, and things like that, that he, he announced plans to do. And he then was able to use that as a vehicle to slam those on the left who were critical of the state of Israel. And you are someone that resides firmly on the left politically. Um, what what did that make you feel like? Because for me on the outside looking at it, it, it seemed to diminish the importance of anti-Semitism because it was being used to win political points oh, you don't like Israel, that means you're anti-Semitic, you hate all Jewish people. And that, to me, takes away from the cause of Jewish people and trying to battle against something that you have battled against for as long as, as, long as time has existed, as long as Jewish culture has existed. Hello, I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a Tad Predictable hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa, he does Anfield Index. He presents a Tad Predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL Roundtable, they're every week after the Premier League match week. So make sure you listen to everything we're doing on EPL Index and follow us there on Twitter at EPL Index. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, yeah, you're, you, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head there because one of the other things is uh, Jews in America often get uh, 
accused of dual loyalty tropes, i.e., are we loyal to Israel or are we loyal to the U.S.? You can be very, very clear from what I'm saying that I'm not loyal to either. So, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it is what it is. But at the same time, you know, what you're speaking about, people on the right basically saying, you know, you're, you should support Israel because you're doing and trying to weaponize that has been really disturbing and disgusting to people who actually, you know, like me, sit on the left, are Jewish, and don't view the world in such a deeply polarized way where we think that because I'm this, I have to believe this. And for and, and kind of forcing that framing out into the popular culture of the you know popular political and media culture of the US and Western societies does nothing to help. Does absolutely nothing to help because it makes us seem as if we are just a political block that is aligned to a foreign state rather than just, you know, a collective of individuals who have a shared culture. Yeah, I, I think the whole idea that you have to be as an American Jewish person like yourself that you have to be loyal to one or the other is is just such a bizarre mentality to have. And again, it does largely come from the far right, those people that may or may not uh, engage in inappropriate relations with flags and anthems and things like that. This misplaced sense of, of self where you have to define yourself by a very specific set of rules well, I'm this, so therefore I'm also this, this, and this. For example, I'm a Republican from the South, therefore I have to be pro-gun, I have to be anti-abortion, I have to be anti-tax, I have to be, uh, you know, anti-immigration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This, this failure for people to be open-minded and realize that, well, just because... I may or may not stand on this side of the political fence on one item doesn't mean I have to stand there on every single item. Just because culturally I view myself as A, I don't also have to be B, C, and D. I could be A, 2, C, and 4. I can pick from both columns. I can have my own identity. I can decide who I am as a person. But that seems to often get lost. And I think this feeds back into what we were talking about with the issues of the tribalism in football, where people, you mentioned the the Tottenham fans are, uh, uh, adopting the terminology, the Yid army, and then people who are not Jewish, but are a Tottenham fan, deciding that they were also part of the Yid army and like you said, the word Yid, and I probably shouldn't be saying it myself, is offensive unless a Jewish person is, a person is saying it about themselves. In the same way, I guess, as when a black person uses the N-word about themselves or their friends, it is, while not ideal, it is acceptable, whereas it's not if somebody else does it. If I identified with a group of black men because I enjoyed the same music as them and then started using that phrase, there would be an issue. There should you also be... be... Their friend. You wouldn't be their friend for very long. <laughs> no, I would not. Exactly. I would I would probably not be breeding for very long either. But th this, is what, this is what I mean. Like, you have to understand that just because you have, you know, one ideology doesn't mean you have to follow the rest. You, you can't just be sheep going along in a queue you have to take a step back and realize well you know this this is not okay in the same way that when we see one idiot reply to a tweet from the liverpool account with you know something about heisel and then 18 more idiots who support the same club follow up with the same thing this is the same mindset as we see in, in the political sphere, we see it in this football sphere, we see it everywhere. And it does just come down to a tribalistic belief of, well, this is what the people I associate myself with 
believe and therefore I must believe it or I don't fit in. Yeah, and I, and I think it's it's perfectly, I mean, this is the easiest thing to say. It's okay to not fit in if the thing that you were trying not, if the thing that you are, you know, quote unquote, being asked to fit in with is toxic and is racist and is anti-Semitic and is you know, homophobic and, you know, so on and so forth. You don't have to sink to the level of the worst person you know. And that's exactly what they do. And that's how we end up in a situation where so often we see hate-filled things on social media and in real life gather momentum and support and become so prevalent that it, it, it just it does so much damage to so many people. It, it, it puts so many people into a, a, a small box. And I remember when you tweeted, you quote tweeted the same tweet that I had tweeted or I had retweeted. And I don't remember your exact words. I think it was something like 8,000 retweets, which is what I had at the time. I guess Jewish Liverpool fans can walk alone, something along those lines. And I saw that afterwards because obviously in the furore of what was going on, we we had blocked each other. You had blocked me on Twitter. We had done mutual blocking. Yes, exactly. And and I didn't see that tweet until you unblocked me and I unblocked you. And we had we had spoken at this point. And it was when I saw that tweet, and I'd already spoken to you and apologized. It was when I saw that tweet. It really did sort of open my eyes a lot more. Having having already had a couple of days to kind of think about things, it was when I saw that and I realized, you know, the harm that this can actually do, the harm that words on social media, the harm that ev- everything that comes out of our mouths can cause, it goes way beyond just, you know, like if I said to you, Justin, you're an arsehole. And you said to me, Dave, you're a prick. We'd be angry, but you'd move on. We've both been called worse. Of course we have. (laughs) Many, many times. (laughs) But the thing is, if I... When I think... When I thought about it then, and then I I read some of the things that you had said on on Discord and stuff, and I realised that what that... That kid that said that, in all likelihood didn't consider the connotations of what he said. He probably just thought, this is a funny joke. I'm going to say it now. Regardless of whether it was a joke or not, it was in obviously very, very bad taste. But what he didn't consider, what I didn't consider, and what everybody else that kind of fed oxygen into that tweet didn't consider was the knock-on effect of yourself and likely many, many others like you having days where this is the one of the things that consumes your your time your thoughts your energy and i'm sure you went through a range of, of emotions from being angry to being upset to being angry again to you know it, to it, be, was, to, mostly, it was mostly anger of course of course <laughs> but you know but like that was something that took a couple of days of your life into a different path than what those days should have been you should have been able to use those days to do whatever it is you had planned to do with your wife or with your family or or whatever and while you may have still been able to do those things your mind is still consumed by what has been said on social media and that should never be the case and as i say there was likely many more like you and the same thing if you i'm not sure if you saw the idiot leeds fan who took a picture of himself with a picture of this, with a, a copy of the Sun, and had a, an offensive headline on it, like that. He thought that was a joke. He thought that was funny. Now, as it turns out, he ended up. I think he got a slap at the game. He got arrested at the game, and he is now banned for life from attending all Leeds fixtures. And he deserves all of that. But what he didn't realize is that. What he actually did was he sent 
the families and friends of 97 people that died at Hillsborough into a weekend-long spin of emotion that they should not have had to deal with. And the same thing with yourself. You should not have had to deal with that spin of emotion, that that rise of anger. Because as we all know, when we get angry, nobody's a nice person to be around when they're angry. So it's not just you then, it's it's your wife, it's the people that you spend time with. If you if you have this and it's playing in the back of your mind, you're not yourself. So you're not going to be as enjoyable to be around as you might normally be. Yeah, that's, that, that's, and that's exactly true. And, you know, I, I think it's ultimately the, uh, the, the last thing I'd like to say on this particular podcast about it is, you know, obviously we play against Tottenham tomorrow. And the only thing that I would like a Tottenham supporter to be upset by at the end of 90 minutes tomorrow is simply the result of the football. Right. I would like us to win. That's the only thing I would like for them. I don't want there to be anything else. I don't think there will be anything else because, again, Liverpool supporters haven't typically gone down that path in Spurs, mm. and and hopefully they never do. Um, I don't think I don't think it's going to start now. And I also know that there's just so many in the supporter, you know, in the traveling support where if they heard anything like that, um, that would be a person who would find themselves, you know, anybody doing the hissing sound from the, the traveling Liverpool support would find themselves. Uh, very quickly course corrected with extreme prejudice, I believe. Yes, I do believe that to be the case. Yeah, and you're and... right. The only thing we should want to inflict on Spurs fans tomorrow is the misery of a defeat. It yeah. shouldn't be any sort of prejudice, prejudicial hatred that not just spoils their their Sunday, but goes on to spoil their week. Because at the end of the day, regardless of who they support. They're still just, they're people. They're people like us. The only difference between us and them, aside from maybe their accents, is that they support one football club and we support another. And that's it. That's the only difference. Their religion, their race, none of it should ever come into it. None of that is fair game. Like, the the, the Leeds fan... I saw a couple of people making disparaging comments about the fact that he was Irish. Now, I think before all of this, I might have reacted and I might have called that out, but I just blocked the people that were making those comments. I saw others, many others, uh, referring to his appearance and the fact that he looked a little bit like a trophy because he had quite a big set of ears. And I thought, you know what? That's fair game. That's fair game. You, that's funny. Say that. If you, if you if you open if you're willing to open yourself up to that by doing something as dumb as he did, mm. you know what? Yeah, you can get made fun of for that shit. You brought exactly. it to yourself. Exactly. But you know, he, he didn't his actions didn't open up all Irish people to to abuse about potatoes or throwing patties or whatever the case might be. Yeah. Um in, in the same way that supporting Tottenham doesn't open you up to abuse about being Jewish or the club having a Jewish identity. It just doesn't. It never should. Is there anything else you want to, to touch on before we before we wrap up? I think I think we've I think we've covered this pretty exhaustively. I just also want to, you know, again say a, a thank you to you, Dave, for um, you know being willing to be open to hearing, you know, someone else's point of view on something and, you know, using it as an opportunity to, you know, use your platform to, uh, to reach people on, on, on something that they may not have considered. What I saw it as, Justin, to be totally honest, was an opportunity to learn and to, to grow and develop because... I, I do think of myself as somebody who calls out wrong when I see it, whether it be racism, whether it be homophobia, whether it be bigotry of whatever kind. And I realized in the aftermath of what happened on, on Twitter that I, and on the Discord and between myself and yourself that I'm not it nearly educated enough on 
Jewish faith, Jewish culture, and what anti-Semitism is. I, I have a, you know, I had a, a very basic idea. I knew, you know, the obvious things, Holocaust denial, the hissing stuff. I, I was aware of that type of stuff. It was more how broad ranging it can be, because I think, and this is my own ignorance, I had viewed anti-Semitism as more of a a religious thing than a cultural thing. And now that I've spent the last few days kind of reading up as much as I can and, and talking to a couple of different people and obviously having this conversation with yourself, I, I, I feel like I have a better understanding. I feel like I'm now better positioned to call out that type of thing as and when I see it. And the bigger thing for me, obviously, was you know, I, I know I, I'm I'm very hot headed as a person. I, I I the first to hold my hands up. I know I'm quite confrontational, and it's funny because it's only on certain things that I can I really get confrontational about. And I I took the criticism that came my way, which was fully justified criticism, as people saying I was anti-Semitic, and that's what kind of sparked the anger in me and and. I obviously did the Daily Red, which I'm actually going to ask Guy after we finish to just delete that episode because uh, I, I meant to do it before. Um, I had when I when I took you know took a swipe at you and took a swipe at a couple of other people. It was it was just out of an anger that had built up because I I didn't realize what people were actually saying to me. I kind of viewed it as a very black and white thing and didn't look at the gray area, which was people more trying to protect me from my own stupidity than anything else. And that's basically what led to the whole big blow up. But I am glad that we've been able to to talk about this. I'm glad we were able to connect um, in the days after that. And I want to thank, thank Gags and, and Eddie um, for their patience on this as well, and I, I think may well have ruined part of of Gags's uh, trip to to Vegas. So apologies for that, bud. But you you're, you're loaded. You're rotten with money. You'll, you'll get we, it. We, we, don't, we don't know if he's actually won or lost any money with the gambling, so we don't know how much his trip was potentially ruined. That's a good point, actually, because he does brag quite a lot about what a good poker player he is. The chances are he might be up on the trip. Um, you need to get hold of Mando. I think Mando spent a couple of days with him there. Mando might have seen what action was going on, and uh, <laughs> and we can we can dig into this matter further. Maybe that's the next podcast. Gags is gambling habits, um, but yeah, no. Look, I th- I hope that people have found this podcast as as educational as I have. That was the whole purpose of this was to just give people more of an, an idea of of what it is that we're facing here, and you know, make people more aware, and and hopefully give people the you know, the push that when they see this type of stuff, to call it out. Even, even like I said, with that with that young lad who sent that tweet, I, I don't believe, now, you're obviously better positioned to say whether you think he was or not. I don't believe he was being anti-Semitic. I don't think, I, I don't think, I don't think he wasn't either. I think he was basically just trying to use what's the most extreme book I can possibly yes. think of to make this particular point about Jordan Henderson. Exactly. You know, it, it's the whole point of there. It's the whole point of there are more creative ways to to make your feelings known about something. Um, the English language is a is a language that has a lot of different words that you could use a lot of different ways to describe things. Um, you know, the whole point here again is also I'm not asking anybody to like Jordan Henderson or rate his ability to play football in the year 2022 because that's not even close. to the yeah, point just, here is just don't compare his book to to uh, yeah, a manuscript for genocide. Yeah, don't compare his book to a manuscript for genocide. And then, like, and, and the other thing, following this perspective of seeing it from the perspective of anti-Semitism, because I'm Jewish and I'm very sensitive. This course. is not that does not mean that there are also that that, that does not mean that um, for one thing, I have a license to basically make any sort of comments about anybody else's culture or race or you know identity because I don't. And also, if you see someone doing this, um, it is perfectly okay to call it out mm. because you know what? 
the only way, the way within which racism and bigotry survive is that they go unchallenged. Yeah. And that's exactly it. And they go unchallenged and we don't make enough effort to educate people on these topics. And I think if, if in the kind of immediate aftermath of him tweeting that before it caught steam and momentum and, and kind of went viral as it did, if someone had just said to him, you know, you really can't say that because it's, it's incredibly insulting for reasons A, B, and C. He may well just have deleted the tweet and apologized. You know? Yeah, and if he didn't, that's when you know he's an asshole. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly it. So thank you for your time today, Justin. I will let you get back to your Saturday. Uh, Justin wanted to brag earlier on and let us all know that in New York right now, it is shorts weather. Um, Guy, unfortunately, lives in Iceland, and uh, he's wearing a coat with the heater on. It is, uh, it's just the surprise of nobody. It is drizzling rain where I live. But, you know, we don't all, all get to live in New York. We don't all get to enjoy uh, the sunshine and the heat in November. It's November. We should be clear. This might not be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Climate change, people. It is real. <laughs> <laughs> it is real. Right, Justin, have you got any projects coming up with AI? Will you be doing the Nina show anytime soon or, or what's the plan? I don't. I'm probably going to, I, I, I'm maybe, you know, uh, something around the U.S. men's national team during the World Cup. Um, you know, because I, cause I, like, uh, I like the pain of you know, <laughs> clicking myself to Greg Berhalter's particular brand of football. But um no, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll am probably be back on uh, NKS after we come back from the World Cup. Um, but otherwise, you know, looking forward to, you know, maybe uh, getting my uh, commentary on the three and no more than three games that the U.S. men's national team will probably end up playing. It'll be <laughs> Something to look forward to. So uh, you can follow Justin on Twitter, Rolls on Shabos. You can follow his work as well with LFCNY at LFC on y, NY on, tri- on Twitter. If you live in New York or the greater New York area or you're visiting New York, get in touch with the lads. If there's a Liverpool game on, who better to watch it with? And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you all for listening. I hope you have found it as interesting as I have and hopefully it's been as educational for some as it has been for me. So thank you always. Take care. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.